Okay, welcome to If by Rudyard Kipling, an incredibly famous, well-known poem that for generations has been taught within British schools and seen as a way to live your life. It's very famous. That's not to say it's also looking at it through the lens of 21st century eyes. It's not also quite a controversial poem as well. We're going to go through this video. It's going to help you understand the poem. It's going to help you get better grades in your exams. We'll have a look at a quick biography of the writer. Really important you know a little bit about who he was and the time he was, he was living in and experiencing. We'll have a look at the poem itself, analysing it in a lot of depth to really make sure you understand and get the best grade. We'll also study the rhyme scheme, the rhythm, form and metre, and we'll also have a look at the themes that are within the poem. So, without further ado, let's start off with the biography. In 1865, Kipling was born on the 30th of December in Bombay, which it used to be known, which we nowadays call Mumbai in India. He was the son of John Lockwood Kipling and Alice Kipling. He was taken to school in South Sea, England, and he was sent to live with a couple called Captain and Mrs. Holloway at Lorn Lodge. Now, what's really important to already think about, Kipling was born in Mumbai, in what was Bombay. Okay, remember the British have colonized India at this point and it's known as British India basically, okay? You've had lots of British people move over and set up businesses and there's a real belief that the white way is right, that they have more understanding, they're more intelligent, they're superior to the natives, to the Indians. So it's important to remember this. He was born in India to British parents, but would have regarded himself as being above the native peoples. He then, aged six, was taken to a school in South Sea in England, separated from his family, and he was put in the care of Captain and Mrs. Holloway. His parents returned to India, and he was kind of alone. Mrs. Holloway took an instant dislike to Kipling and alongside her son would bully him quite ferociously, uh, which obviously caused him to be very, very unhappy as a young boy. A few years later, his mother returns. Six years later, she comes back from India and she moves him from South Sea to a cheap boarding school in Devon. Now here he becomes much happier, begins to have more friends and things like this. He certainly isn't getting bullied as he was in his last residence. Six years he spent in it though, a long time and mental health wise will obviously have impacts on him in later life. Okay, we fast forward a few years to 1881. He returns to India and begins working as a journalist, um, joining his parents in Lahore, which nowadays Pakistan, but was India at the time. Working for the Civil and Military Gazette. Now again, remember, a boy born in India to British parents, sent to England, comes back. He obviously feels himself as being superior and better. And he's keeping very closely with the expats, the expatriates who are living in India, ruling it. He begins as an assistant editor to an English newspaper for the British in northern India called the Civil and Military Gazette. All these ideas of rule Britannia almost brought up in the title alone. Fast forward a few more years to 1889, and whilst he's working as a journalist for a newspaper called The Pioneer, he became their roving reporter, reporting from all over the world. Some of the countries he visited were Burma, which is now Myanmar, Singapore, Hong Kong and, Hong Kong and Canton, Japan and San Francisco, and he then crossed America, which wasn't very common in these days for your average person to do. He was not an average person. In 1890, he suffered a nervous breakdown. He becomes very famous, and there was a, he was subject to an editorial in the Times on the 25th of March, 1890. It all got, it seems it all got a bit much for him being so well recognised, becoming famous, and so on. And he suffered a mental health breakdown as a result. Between 1890 and 1900, he settled down, had had children. He wrote about the war, he wrote many short stories and poems, but he wrote a lot about the war and from 1892 onwards he started to write more for children, perhaps reflecting the fact he had three of his own. In 1894 the super famous Jungle Book was published. Perhaps you didn't know it, but Kipling was the man who wrote the famous Jungle Book. He has three children with his wife, Josephine, Elsie and John. 
and in 1898 he starts to spend more time in South Africa and began a friendship with Cecil Rhodes. If you want even more background analysis, Google Cecil Rhodes and just see the controversy that this man brought with him. He really was a racist and a colonialist. For me, there's no other language to use for the man. Um, he's had busts of his head removed from British universities. He's been disowned by a lot of people in the 21st century. And it's important to remember Kipling kept company with him and was friends with him. So that perhaps suggests something to us about Kipling's attitudes. His daughter Josephine unfortunately died from pneumonia in 1899, as did Kipling almost die. He was very ill as well. He wrote about the Boer War in South Africa, writing for the newspaper called The Friend, which was published by the British Army. So he really supports the colonialism, the imperialism of the British Empire. He is fiercely proud to be British and sees himself as being above the native peoples of whether it be South Africa or whether it be India. Okay, we move on. In 1907, he's awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. So his star has really risen. He's very famous and a very talented writer as well, it must be mentioned. And it's important to remember, although not excusing it, Kipling is a product of his time. It wasn't controversial to hold the views that he held at that time. In fact, it was commonplace to believe such things. He was in the majority, not the minority. So it's important to remember that. Whether it excuses what he wrote or believed or not is a different issue, but it's important to remember it. Okay. In 1910, Rewards and Fairies is published and it contains his most famous poem, If, the poem we're going to be looking at. Fast forward between 1915 and 33, his son John Kipling is firstly remote, is reported missing, presumed dead, in his very first battle on the Western Front in World War I. Since then, from then until his death, uh, he would suffer, sorry, not we, he would suffer in great pain from what was later diagnosed as a stomach ulcer. Surely Kipling would have felt guilty for this. He really encouraged his son John to go off and fight for the British in the war. He thoroughly encouraged him to do it. And perhaps with his son subsequently dying in his very first battle, perhaps he might feel very guilty about this for encouraging his son to enlist in the army and join the fight. Indeed, he would then continue to write about war for the rest of his life. No more stories like the Jungle Book from him. His stomach, it was, his illness was finally diagnosed as a stomach ulcer in 1933. So many years of pain and agony and not knowing what it was. And in 1936, following a hemorrhage, Kipling dies on the 18th of January. His ashes were buried at noon in Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey on the 23rd of January and he lies next to the graves of both Charles Dickens and Thomas Hardy. It's a special place in Westminster Abbey where the literary poets called Poets' Corner, where the greats, the greats of the British literary canon are kept. And it's quite telling that he's buried next to Dickens Hard and Hardy. Really quite interesting and certainly reflects how important he was viewed as being a writer for the British Empire. Okay, in a nutshell, what is this poem about? It's advice to a young man, explicitly his son, but for young men in general, about how to live life and to become a man, a strong man. Kipling later said it was inspired by the betrayal of Dr. Leander Starr Jameson, a colonial explorer who tried to lead a raid against the Boers in 1895. Now, initially, the Brit British government supported this absolutely, but then they disowned him when the plan failed so that they wouldn't look so bad. They disowned him completely and he was left to take all the blame. He was sentenced to 15 months in prison in South Africa. Upon his re Despite this, Jameson kept his head when all about him were losing theirs and blaming it on him. Which has a real echoes, obviously, of the line in If that we're about to see. So, Kipling felt really bad about this. He felt resentment towards the British government for not supporting what his... Um, what is... Uh, what his hero, almost, if you like, had tried to do. He believed it was the right thing to do. 
He later, upon his release, became Prime Minister of the Cape Colony in 1904, before leaving office in 1910, before the creation of the Union of South Africa in 1910. Okay, the actual poem itself is continually aimed, uh, framed, if, then, if this happens, do that. And constantly it's looking like this. He all usually shows the negative idea and then offers positive advice on how to overcome it. And there's a fatherly tone throughout. It sounds like a father giving advice to his son, as was intended, but there's also a feeling of superiority. He has lived an experienced life and therefore he is a bit superior to his son and his son must listen carefully to him, his son and young men in general. The speaker is experienced and he's someone that we should all learn from. He teaches one to live with dignity and to believe in themselves seemingly at all costs. And he covers most aspects of life and difficulties a person might encounter during life. And this is what it really does. It's advice on how to be successful and to be a man. There's a feeling here, though, that this is aimed perhaps more at middle and upper classes who are able to achieve such things. Perhaps those from poorer working class families wouldn't be able to do the things that he necessarily goes on to talk about. Really talking about leading men and things like that. It's a... Uh, the tone, I feel, for me, is aimed more towards them. I think, in his opinion, probably the, the poorer possibly wouldn't be able to achieve such things. His ultimate message, though, is to be humble and realistic in everything you do. And he uses a lot of anaphora. Remember, that's words which are repeated at the beginning of lines. He uses a lot of anaphora in the beginning lines, repeating the word if, which suggests an idea that life is unpredictable and is subject to circumstance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, the themes of the poem. Stoicism, being stoic is one of them. The endurance of pain or hardship without the display of feelings and without complaint. The famous British stiff upper lip when you don't complain. Many men came back from seeing horrific things in the world wars and they, were, they didn't talk about it. They were told not to cry, to maintain uh, the decorum of strength, of being a man. Real men didn't cry. In the, in, the, in the old belief of it, the famous British stiff upper lip. And this is what it's saying to do. Enduring pain, hardship, disaster, but not showing your emotion through it. Being tough, being strong, being a man. It's very much a key theme of the poem. Stoicism there, essentially what the poem's about. If you want to pause and have a quick read there of what it is, please feel free to. You'll get a better understanding of what stoicism is and what it means. Okay. We move on. The next theme covered is men and masculinity. What it takes to be a man. And this is all throughout it. It doesn't talk about women, as I go on and say. It doesn't offer any advice to young girls. It advises young men, specifically perhaps his son, but young men in general. And what it is to be a man, to be stoic, not to show emotions with pain and things like this. Explicitly advice for the male gender. And I'm suggesting perhaps women are not important. It's, there's no mention of the opposite sex and how they can perhaps um, enhance a man's life. It's very much man, man, man. Show no emotion. Do not allow yourself to be affected by things is the key message and related to the stoicism. Finally, loss and defeat. The poem deals with the losses of things from pride to money and it offers you a solution for how to overcome them. It acknowledges the realities of life, that life isn't perfect, life isn't always going to be easy going. We will come up against hardships and difficulties, but it teaches positivity over regret. Okay, moving on. We get into the colours used. So we're going to start analysing. Any words or boxes which are in yellow are questions from me to you to get you to think about what I'm asking. Okay? You really need to develop your own analysis here. Just following my advice will get you a good grade, I'm sure. But you really want to understand it. Really internalise it and use it to form your own opinions. That's how you're going to be most successful in English literature. Listen to what I'm saying, but don't agree with me on everything, but allow it to plant a seed that you can then grow into a wonderful plant, so to speak, of your own analysis and your own ideas. But these questions I will pose to make you think. 
Light blue indicates poetic techniques, metaphor, simile, assonance, enjambment, cesura, everything like this. Orange boxes will explain word choices a little bit more. Perhaps unfamiliar words you're not sure of, I will explain what these words a little bit more. And green for growth indicates analysis. So it's analysing the word choice or the technique or the idea contained within the poem. Now sometimes these, these colours will change. Perhaps I'll have green but be talking about a poetic technique. But it's developing that analysis. And you'll begin to see many, many, many more of these sorts of pictures, uh, images in the next few seconds. So, stanza one. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. Okay, let's get in about the first couple of lines. First of all, we look at the use of anaphora, the same word being used at the beginning of each line. If you can keep your head and all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust, if you can wait. Suggesting the idea of this, this possibility, if this happens, then do that. And lots of circumstances which you might encounter within your life. Also the continued use of the personal pronoun you, you are yourself. It's aiming it at you. You are the, are the, especially if you're a young man in Kipling's eyes, are the subject, so the purpose of this poem. It's advice directly to you. So the use of the personal pronoun you, your, yourself, just directly connects the poem to the reader. And it conveys the idea that we are being addressed to. We are being given the advice. Okay, let's get in about it then. So, the word choice of head you can keep your head when all about you associated with intelligence and calmness and coolness under pressure. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. We don't take a breath after the final word you of the first line. We continue. There's no punctuation there. So we continue. This technique, remember, enjambment. It makes these lines longer. Perhaps it's trying to echo the feel of people speaking quickly and over each other. The madness when people are losing their heads. And that's why he's used this use of enjambment here. Are losing theirs and blaming it on you. It's a contrast between you and how you should react compared to others losing their heads and losing control. If you can trust yourself, be confident in your own abilities, my son. And it suggests not those of others. Trust, your, trust what you believe, your truth. Now, my question here. Men are blaming it on you and when all men doubt you. Why would everyone else be blaming and doubting you? What does that suggest? Does that suggest perhaps your ideas aren't actually that good? If the majority of people do not follow and support your idea and they're resistant to it, perhaps you need to listen. He's saying still believe in yourself when other men doubt you. I'm not sure if that's the best advice. Surely you should listen to others and make your own opinions. But he says, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. He's telling you to be humble. Listen to the other's opinions. My argument is, He's saying just don't necessarily accept them. Show that you're listening. Pay lip service that you're listening. But don't worry about it too much. Stay in your own, in your own frame of mind. Stay in your own direction. Believe in what you're believing. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, we're sold it's a sign of virtue, being able to wait. And not be tired of waiting. Lied, lies, hated, hating. What happenings here? It's loose word choice repetition. We've got wait, waiting, lied, lies, hated, hating. We've got different forms, different forms of the verbs here. Clear opposites are, op are offered. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, so have that, be able to wait, so don't get bored of it. Or being lied about, people telling lies about you, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, people will hate you. Don't give way to hating. On the surface, really quite good advice actually for anyone. If you're being lied about, don't tell lies to people and make it even worse. Don't stoop to their level. If someone hates you, don't start hating them back or hating other people. Remain positive. 
that's really quite nice, you know? And it offers us balance, which I think is what Kipling's trying to say. The message of the whole poem is achieving that balance in life. It's really important. And just the physical structure, looking at these lines, wait, waiting, lied, lies, hated, hating, it offers that balance. It balances a line up metaphorically. And we're told, are being lied about. Now, I want to mention here the use of caesura, the po poetic technique when you've got a comma in the middle of a line or a bit of punctuation in the middle of a line. As readers, it forces us to slow down, to take a pause. Kipling is doing this to make us think, to pause and to reflect. It also echoes the idea of a father imparting advice to his son. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. It echoes the kind of style that he might be explaining this to his son in with the pauses intentionally there for us as readers to pause and to reflect perhaps a little bit about the idea of being hated or being lied about and then the resolution of how to get around it. These two lines are the realities of life and there's quite quite religious-esque language about it as well. It feels like it has come from a Christian Bible or a hymn or something like this. It's very easy to remember as well, and this is the key to it as well. It's an easy poem to remember. You remember, if that, then that. If that, then that. And yet, don't look too good, nor talk too wise. It's telling you to keep your humility. However, I feel there's an air of arrogance and superiority about this, as there is throughout the whole poem. I've already mentioned my feeling that Kipling felt he was superior to the natives of countries like India or Africa, or South Africa, sorry, which had been colonised by, by the white peoples. And it's this idea, don't yet, and yet, don't look too good, which suggests that you kind of do look good, that you are intelligent and above others, nor talk too wise, again suggesting that you have the ability, you have more intelligence, you are wiser than other people as well. So there's that little bit of arrogance about it for me. There's also the use of the colon there, telling us that the following stanza will develop this idea. Okay, we see it at the end of stanza two as well. Stanza two, if you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to, broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. Okay, we see a more regular rhyme scheme here, which I'll go on and explain after we've analysed it. Let's start off, dreams being related to the first stanza, the idea of the head in line one relates to dreams as well. Also, dreams can be used as a metaphor here for your ambition and creativity. If you can dream, if you have the ability to dream and not make dreams your master, not allow the dreams to govern your absolute every single thinking, waking moment. Be realistic in life, but don't have your goals determine you. If you can dream and not make dreams, don't become obsessed with dreams and only be dread with, uh, led with them. We've got a link this idea of dreaming and thinking, the use of rationale and logic. These two ideas are there. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think, if you can use logic and rationale, don't just dream. Use that as well. And yet not make thoughts your aim. Don't think for thinking sake, basically. Use your thoughts and use your intelligence rationally and, and, and wisely and logically. Act on your thoughts, but don't force them. Be realistic. We then get introduced to two actors here. Triumph and disaster. Very interesting use of personification. They're capitalised letters which make them into proper nouns. Why has he done this? Well, for me, it echoes the idea of characters in a Greek morality play. The ancient Greeks wrote a lot of plays in which we had characters learning a lesson and the intention was to impart the lesson, the moral lesson, upon the audience. And it would do it through personifying things like triumph, disaster, and so on. And for me, I think that he is simply, I think he's simply saying here, Kipling is saying that triumph and disaster with a nod towards the ancient Greeks, this is something that's always existed. This is something, it's not some anything that's new. 
we then get a use of consonants and treat those two imposters just the same. Okay, the continuing repeated t t t sound. For me, it really gives the idea of the father speaking to the child and really being very resolute with the idea of triumph, when things are going great, and disaster, when things are absolutely terrible, and treat those two imposters just the same. You can almost hear him spitting or see him spitting on the young person's face as he's saying it. Do not treat them the same. They are imposters. He's perhaps suggesting that triumph and disaster don't actually happen very often in life. They don't happen regularly. And certainly not to just dwell on triumph as thinking you're the best, you're amazing. And likewise, don't dwell on the idea of disaster as your world's collapsed, the, the world's coming to an end. It's offering those two sides. Do not see them, see them as irregularities. They're imposters, but treat them just the same. So it doesn't matter if things are going brilliantly or terribly for you. Treat them just the same. Maintain your humbleness. Remain humble throughout. If you can bear the, to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Interesting here. Very emotive. If you can bear, it emphasises how difficult it might be to hear such truths twisted by knaves and made a trap for fools. To hear something that you've said that you believe true to be twisted for other people. The era of fake news is not new, so to speak. This has been happening for ages. When you are honest about something and someone else distorts what you said and tells it to somebody else to make you look bad. So if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves and has made a trap for fools. My question here though, how do we know what we are thinking is the absolute truth? He's implied beforehand, listen to others but don't necessarily accept it. Remain resolute in your beliefs. And now we're seeing the word choice of truth, the truth. What is truth? And who is one person to say what they believe in is the truth? This is a big question for you. A lot a bit like how people in previous in the previous stanza weren't were arguing and not believing them. Again, how do you know this is the truth? Maybe the truth is wrong and by the knaves and fools twisting it are actually making it into the real the reality, realistic truth. So again, just be skeptical with this. We get word choices of knaves and fools. Analytically, he's simply saying problems have always existed. We've got the nod to the ancient Greeks with triumph and disaster. We've now got knaves and fools being mentioned, constantly mentioned in Shakespearean works. A knave is just simply someone who's a bit of an idiot, or somebody who perhaps is trying to cause problems for you. And we're told, don't allow them. You know, if you can bear to hear what you've said twisted by fools who just want to twist it for their own gain, to make a trap for other people, fools, these other people who are fools, he's separating them as from knaves. He's saying the knaves are the ones who intend to do damage, but the fools are the innocent people who perhaps just listen to these knaves and believe what everything that they're saying. Knaves and fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to, broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. He's saying here, be strong, do not give up in tough times. Maintain keep following your dreams don't let them govern you but keep following them be strong be resolute we've got an interesting bit of caesura here as well in the second but final line or watch the things you gave your life to broken that caesura that comma forces us to slow to take a pause watch the things you gave your life to making you think about the things perhaps you've given your life to and emphasizing broken just imagine that, something that you've worked for, let's say you're 30 years old, something that you've worked all your life for, or even if you're a teenager working hard towards doing your exams, then it's broken, disaster, you fail. He's saying you need to stoop back up and build up with worn out tools. With the same things that you did last time, you're resolute, you're determined, you try again, try again, try again. Which again isn't necessarily bad advice. Things you gave your life to, most important, and things that you've worked hardest for. Okay, to the third stanza. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it all on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sign you to serve you your turn long after they are gone. 
And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. Okay, let's break this down. If you can make one heap of all your winnings, um, a gambling uh, um, metaphor, if you like, a gambling analogy, everything that you've won, bringing it into one big pile, linking to the triumph that we saw mentioned in stanza two, and gamble it and risk it all in one gamble of a gambling game called pitch and toss, linking to the disaster of stanza two, and lose further disaster. And start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. Start again from before you were successful, from before you were rich. And also then maintain, never breathe a word about your loss. Maintain your honour or pride. Question comes back to this idea. Is this telling you to be above everyone else and actually not take responsibility for your mistakes? I very much feel it is. If you make a mistake, you should own up to it. If you fail, you should probably own up about it. It might help others who have failed. But no, Kipling is saying, don't breathe a word about it. Be quiet. And he's also used enjambment after the words beginnings and lose. And start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. By the time you get to the word loss, without taking a breath after the line ending in beginnings, you're out of breath. You're not breathing a word. So the writers quite cleverly used enjambment there to emphasise, to reflect, to mirror that feeling of not breathing a word. Got the word choice of force now. Suggesting it's against your will. Although you might not want to, you should. If you can force your heart and nerve and sign you to serve your turn long after they are gone. The repetition of and used to emphasise using every part of your body to make sure that you are the strongest and most resolute. Do not give up every fibre to serve you long after they are gone. After you have died, your name, your memory will live on is what he's suggesting. There's an enjambment there as well, just emphasising the idea of the effort required in the enforcing your heart and everything else to serve you, to honour you long after they are gone. It's a metaphor, but for your ideas, for your beliefs, for what you said to be remembered once you are gone, once you are dead. And the word choice of serve, does it suggest, suggest for me superiority that his body is to serve him, just like... You could argue the natives of India, of South Africa, were chosen to serve him, the Raj, the white person, the superior person. Is this perhaps what we can analyse from this? He likely didn't intend it, but we, as readers, especially in the 21st century, we can analyse it and look at it this way. What it does is it enforces your argument. If you're taking the same argument as me, all these different word choices, techniques, metaphors, similes, They just enforce what I'm saying. So you've got to do it in an essay. Make your point clear and use it with lots of evidence, different word choices to back up what you're saying. Likewise, if you disagree with me, please do. You can use my analysis to disagree with me and to create your own, even better. So this idea of serve. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on, stop. Saying to be strong, don't give up in tough times, maintain and keep following your dreams. The idea as well to hold on, you keep on going except the will, capitalise, proper noun, like another character, like triumph and disaster. It's like another character, the importance of it, your will, your mental strength, which says to them, hold on. Okay, the idea that it's saying to them to not to, not, not to die, but, but to keep on Almost keep on living, keeping your memory alive as you go forward after your death. There's a use of personification there as well. And hold on, it's emphatic, it's very instructional. Believe in yourself, you can achieve anything. You are the man, you are the best. That's what it's kind of trying to say. And so we move, we meander into the final stanza of the poem. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if ne- neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all, el- if all men count with you, but none too much, cut. Okay, so stanza four, the final stanza of the poem. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, 
nor lose a common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Okay, a nice climatic ending. If you follow all my rules, you will be a man, and that's more important than anything else. Let's go back to the beginning of this stanza. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, if you're able to talk with crowds, crowds of normal, common people, but still maintain high standards, for me it's suggesting superiority. You're above the common, normal person. But walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. You can deal with rich and powerful people, but don't lose the common touch, the humbleness, the humility, which is being emphasised throughout this entire poem. Word choice of walk and talk as well. If you can talk with crowds, but you can also walk. If you can walk the, if you can talk the talk, say the right things, but walk the walk as well. Do the right things. That's vitally important. He's saying. He goes on to tell us if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you. He's saying it's not only foes, enemies who can hurt you, but loving friends can hurt you as well. Interestingly, lack of talk about women and things like this in the poem got to ask a question loving friends not lovers but loving friends can hurt you it says to us he goes on to say if all men count with you but none too much don't be intimidated by anyone above you treat anyone uh, everyone equally it also suggests so perhaps men counting with you men counting they support you they believe you but also making sure that they're able to create and do their own things or able to make their own opinions that they're not at the same level as you and he goes on and does a, and creates a running metaphor here if you can fill the forgiving unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run view life realistically calmly and positively he's really saying don't allow us to be compounded by our biggest fears and, and worries. Don't, don't look at things for realistically what they are. Sometimes we make bigger problems out of things than they really are in our minds. And this is what he's saying. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, then Jean meant reinforcing the idea of the unforgiving minute, of it going on over quite a long time. But he's saying two things here. He's saying on one hand, it's an unforgiving minute. If you're doing a lot distance run, a 10 kilometer or a marathon or something like this, that last minute is incredibly tough, he's saying. It's very difficult. You feel your body is about to collapse and everything. But he's saying, do you view it as an unforgiving minute or do you see it as just being 60 seconds worth of distance runs? Look at things realistically. Don't allow your mind to make things worse than they actually are. Be realistic. We've got a use of sibilance here as well. 60 seconds. 60 seconds worth of distance run. We've got this. S -s. Remember, sibilance is a repetition of the s, -s, -s, -s sounds. So we have it here. It's not just alliteration. 60 seconds is alliteration. But we have the words distance. Dis. So we've got 60 seconds worth of distance run. Now I'm saying that this sibilance, always people say, sibilance, alliteration, metaphor. This metaphor is effective. This sibilance is effective. But you need to say why. These are types of sound imagery. Therefore, you have to explain to, to the examiner in your essays what the sound represents. And don't make it different. This sound. Okay, if it's a poem about a snake, it's making the sound of the snake. But this poem's not about snakes. So we can't say, it's too far-fetched to say, 60 seconds of distance run, ooh, ooh, this suggests a snake, and snakes are dangerous, and he's saying to be careful and run away from a snake. Quick, doesn't work, guys. It doesn't work, okay? It's got to be related. So he's talking about 60 seconds of distance run. Okay, when you're running hard, <laughs> you're panting, you're breathing. <laughs> now, it's a little bit of a stretch of the imagination, granted, but English literature it is. And that's it. This 
sound is related to the distance run, so that's what I'm saying. The sibilance just reflects and echoes the sounds made during the 60 seconds distance run. We're told, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. The word choice of the word man capitalised, it's the point of the poem. Follow these rules and you'll be a man. A little bit more though, I want to look at yours is the earth and everything that's in it. If you're taking the colonialist argument, then he's saying that if you follow these rules, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. Anyone who's not like you, you have power and domain over. Again, read it into colonialization, and it takes a slightly more worrying, dark ref uh, reflection on it. But yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And, Cesura, which is more, Cesura, you'll be a man, my son. The Cesura there is really used that it's the breaking up, it's forcing us, the use of dashes is forcing us to take a pause. And it's again, it's reflecting as if he personally is imparting this advice unto someone else, unto his son or young people. And, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. My son is well directly addressing his son, but again, younger men in general, I feel it's trying to address. Okay. Let's have a look now. Stanza one, the rhyme scheme. Stanza one's rhyme scheme is different to the f to the following to the stanzas which follow it. Let's look at this. You, 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 two, a a a. They all rhyme. Waiting doesn't rhyme with the rest, so we give it a new letter. B. Lies doesn't rhyme with waiting. Doesn't rhyme with you or two, so we give it a new letter. C. Hating though rhymes with waiting, so it's a B. And wise rhymes with lies, so it's a C. So it's an irregular rhyme scheme according to this. It doesn't traditionally make sense. Only this stanza uses it. It's not orderly as we'd expect. It deals with the unpredictability of life and it's reflected in the poem's rhyme scheme. Traditionally, we expect rhyme schemes to be A, A, B, B, A, B, B, A, and so on and so forth. Look at Shakespeare's sonnets, for example. Very structured. This first stanza is not, and perhaps it's suggesting that life is unpredictable. As readers, we expect a rhyme scheme, yet when we see this, we're throwing off a little bit. It's not what we expect, and perhaps that he's using the rhyme scheme irregular structure in this first stanza to reflect the idea that life isn't always, like poetry, what we expect it to be like. We move on to the stanzas after it, though, and we start to see a regular rhyme scheme creep in. Master, aim. Disaster, same. Spoken, fools. Broken, tools. So master and disaster rhyme, aim and same rhyme, spoken and broken rhyme, tools and fools rhyme. So it's an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D rhyme scheme. So it's far more regular, okay? Master, disaster, both A, aim and same B. The reason we technically give C to spoken is because the word spoken doesn't rhyme with same, Disaster, aim, or master. So we give it a new letter. Likewise for fools doesn't rhyme with spoken, same, disaster, aim, master. So we give it a new letter. Broken rhyming with spoken, so it's C. And tools rhyming with fools, so it's a D. So it's an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D rhyme scheme. Far more structured, far more normal, far more what we expect out of poetry. Perhaps the writer's saying in the first stanza, it's like when you're younger almost. It's all disorganized, you don't know what to do in things, but if you listen to his advice and as you mature and get older, things become more structured, especially if you follow his structured rules and routines for life. Reflects order, rationale and maturity as well, and a little bit of logic. Okay, so stanza one's form and meter, the hard part. I've got, I'm going to create other uh, videos explaining form and meter, how to understand them, how to discover yourself on the unseen poetry, what the form and meter of a poem is, which is always going to get you more marks as well. Very quickly though, we have this idea of stressed and unstressed syllables. These, this poem here starts off on an unstressed syllable. We don't say, if you can keep your head when all about you. We don't say it like that. We start off unstressed and go stressed. If you can keep your head when all about you. Okay. Now, what we do is we try to bunch them together into what we call feet. 
A feat contains at least one unstressed and one stressed syllable in it. It could be it can be unstressed, stressed, stressed, for example. But here we see a pattern. We see it in the following line as well. So we group these together into feet. As you can see, there's five of them in each line, which makes it pentameter. An unstressed syllable followed by a stressed is called an iam. There's five feet in the five feet in each line line, so it is iamic pentameter. Okay, and I've made a note there as well. Writers use iamic pentameter because it's well structured, well known, and it shows an element of tradition and class. Shakespeare always used iamic pent not always, but regularly used iamic pentameter. Each syllable at the end of the alternative lines spoils it a little bit. We call it catalexis, a little bit like in The Tiger by William Blake. It kind of spoils it, but my analysis is that it actually doesn't. The reason that the reason that Kipling hasn't changed it and hasn't made it absolutely perfect, like Shakespeare, for example, would do more so, is he's trying to, again, the extra syllable at the end of these lines that just stands out, isn't part of any feat, it's like life, it's unpredictable. Life isn't perfect, and nor is his use of form and meter within this poem. So it's reflecting the idea life isn't perfect. And we get to the end. I want to thank you for watching the video. I do hope it's been useful to you. Please do think about everything that I've been saying and develop your own analysis from it. Use this as a seed with which you water to create a tree of knowledge. What an original metaphor that is. It really is stunning. Okay. Any questions, comments, anything like that, please enter in the comments below. Like and subscribe. It hugely helps me out. So please, please, please like and subscribe right there if you can. Any questions, as I say, do put them into the comments and I will answer them when I get a minute. Again, thank you for watching and until next time.